Are you you're a superhero guy? Uh, I'm limited. I, I like yeah. Superman and Batman. I'm not way into right. You know, like some guys. No, yeah, some nerds. I feel like we're kind of like if we were we were superhero villains, we would be like I would be Lex Luthor, obviously, because right. there's like who else could you be once you were bald? <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure, Paul. I appreciate it a lot. The Selfwire website. Uh, we are graced by your presence. This is awesome. No, no. Thanks for having me. No, absolutely. So one of the things that we want to do here is, you know, bring cutting edge intellectual questions to some of these issues that we don't really talk about. Uh, and not like taboo issues or anything like that, but just some of the issues that guys like you and me, guys, you know, we got to know each other while I was pursuing my doctorate at Trinity. You're a professor there. You know, the kind of stuff that we talk about at the doctoral level, because a lot of theological discussion can sort of stay at that lay level or stay at that even even popular academic, well, well-educated elder type stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I figured, you know, we enjoy talking about theology so much. Yeah. Let's just have a hardcore. Let's just do it. Let's just do it, Let's do it man. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I'm a system magician, yes. so I'm not going to be able to keep up with the NT <laughs> oh, stuff. A lot of stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I had a, I took a, a, a class on union with Christ in the New Testament in my doctorate. It was okay. Professor was okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, Khan was my professor for that. Uh, and uh, it was a great course and it was a great opportunity to chop it up. And we had a lot of great discussions in that class. Um, but my, my first question for you, for, because uh, like every New Testament nerd in the world knows who you are, but a lot of people don't know who you are. So where are you from? How did you become a Christian? What got you into New Testament studies? I know that's kind of three questions, but you know, yeah. that's, what's the story of yeah. Khan is born, now he's a leading <laughs> scholar of New Testament Greek. Yeah, so I was born in the Deep South, meaning Australia. Okay, <laughs> deep, deep. And uh, I originally trained to uh, be a professional jazz musician and studied at music school jazz performance was converted in music school and uh, had to figure out uh, replacing the idol of jazz with Jesus as Lord that was the big thing that had to happen mm. one thing led to another and I uh, went to seminary and kind of discovered a real love for theology for biblical languages but especially for exegesis and, and I really discovered that love and uh, that led to um, further study and uh, teaching at more college in Sydney and uh, and then now teaching here at Trinity so that's kind of it in yeah. a nutshell that's yeah. great yeah. and uh, what was it that really like when you when you say you fell in love with exegesis I mean was it the process of getting to know scripture in the original languages just kind of that euphoric feeling of like this is this is the original text this- well it sort of was an extension of something I fell in love with when I became a Christian which was you know when I first became a Christian I just started reading the Bible and re- just read the New Testament first cover to cover and and it was just spellbound by scripture in fact the way I became a Christian was from hearing the Bible taught uh, you know in church and that's the first time in my life I'd heard it explained clearly and just unpacked and it made so much sense and it was very compelling and convicting mm-hmm. and and so I always had this love of scripture and the power of the Word of God and the way that God uses it to change us and and so uh exegesis greek exegesis in particular just became that on steroids you know like yeah. it was uh let's go deeper let's really think about the details of the greek language and how actually reading what was written originally mm. uh, opened so many opportunities for um thinking about the meaning of the text so you know it was just kind of a natural thing for me and that's always remained exegesis class is still my favorite thing to teach whenever i'm doing greek exegesis in the classroom i'm in my happy place yeah so right and for for anybody who hasn't been to seminary you know at seminary you can take a book on the Pauline epistles, you could take a book on the prophets, or you could take a book on the doctrine of the atonement. But exegesis class is a technical class where you really focus on mastering the the skill of interpreting the original languages of the Bible. And you teach the well, you teach some grammar, right? But you also but you really specialize in teaching those advanced syntax of Greek, really digging down how do we understand how this word is functioning here more than just rote, let's memorize the words, which every every language learner has to do. Yeah. But you really focus 
focus on, okay, how do we, when it comes to debating what these words mean, how do we pack our tool belt with tools to help us dig into the meaning of this? That's a really good way to put it. Yeah, it's a skill set as well as a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn exegesis by doing it. And I try to, and it's as much caught as taught. So I try to model exegesis in the classroom Mm -hmm. and help students to know how to pull in the resources that they have. Uh, to do this work for themselves, yeah, right. And one of the one of the greatest examples. I mean, you've you've written a lot and you've published a lot. You publish everything from advanced studies focusing really on the Greek language itself. But you also have your book with Zondervan in Christ in Paul. Wait, wait. Am I mixing? I'm mixing up that's two books. A different book. I, I'm so, Paul I'm sorry. and Union with Christ. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant. I was uh, involved yes. in that too. Yes. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I was. Uh, I, so were you. <laughs> I created the bibliography for that book in Christ in Paul. So I, uh, that, that's why that my brain always goes back to that, right? But Paul, Paul in union with Christ, yeah. which is really a, a like an analytical analytical taxonomy of all of the prepositions and vocabulary and syntactical tropes that Paul relies upon to express this truth, which is really irreducible to a single preposition or a single concept, but it's a multi-orbed concept. And could you talk a little bit about why did you want to write that particular book? Why was that a needed book? Well, um, I had just uh, recently completed my PhD, had that published and had a follow on book published and I was looking for a new thing to research. And when you do a PhD in Greek grammar, as I did, or Greek syntax, it's easy to get kind of pigeonholed as the language guy. But actually, as I mentioned to you, my great love is exegesis. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did the PhD on language is because that's an incredibly important tool for exegesis, but I didn't want to be stuck in language. I wanted to be doing exegesis. So I was looking for something to bust me out of the language mode. I knew I wanted to do something on Paul, which I'd always, I'd always been fascinated by Paul and loved Paul. And I was actually, I actually sat down with Peter O'Brien, who is a mentor of mine at Moore College. And he, and I was saying, what, what should I do? What, what needs to be done in Paul? And he said, union with Christ needs to be done. And it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I had just that year begun teaching the letter to the Ephesians. And so it was coming across all this in Christ language, through Christ language, with Christ language. And it, you know, it was obviously intriguing. So as soon as he said that, it was like, that's it. That is exactly it. And I fell in love with the theme and the topic and spent five years writing the book. Wow, that's amazing. And and now you're, well, I, I can edit any of this stuff out, by the way, but but now you're writing, can we talk about the book yeah, that's coming forth, forthcoming? Yeah. Now you're doing, it's not really a sequel. It's but, sort of a sequel. So, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind, technically kind of is a sequel. It's yeah. on eschatology. Yeah, it's right? on eschatology. And when I finished the Union with Christ book, I really thought, what? What question is left hanging that mm. this book really suggests for me to pursue? Right. And and eschatology eventually became clear that eschatology was the thing. And it's it's not so much a sequel, but the beginning of a series of mm. topics where I'm going to drill down like that yeah. with Paul's stuff. So Right. And yeah, right. Not just eschatology, but eschatology in Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and for a lot of people, I, I think that the questions of eschatology are bound up in the final coming of Christ, the rapture, you know, that kind of thing. And they don't really think about how the concept of eschatology is presently operative right. and is a fundamental structure yeah. for all of other, Paul's other concepts. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, so actually, if, if I think about the two themes, you know, as you know, I argue that union with Christ is sort of like the webbing that, that mm. connects all of Paul's theological concerns. You know, it connects everything to Christ. But... Um, to extend that metaphor, I would say that eschatology is like the, um, it gives that webbing its shape. Mm-hmm. So, it's the, the frame that the webbing sits on. It, it really frames everything. You know, the fact that the risen Christ has come in the middle of time instead of at the end of time when the resurrection from the dead is supposed to happen. You know, it creates an overlap of the ages. Uh, and for Paul, it means the end is here, but it's not yet. The whole New Testament eschatology of now not yet is created by the resurrection of Christ. And Paul, you know, experiences this on the Damascus Road, you know, and he realizes, I think he realizes at least two things. One, union with Christ, because 
Christ says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Mm. And who's he been persecuting? He's been persecuting the church. Right. So he, he draw, joins the dots and says there's a connection between Christ and his people, the union with Christ. And uh, the fact that the Messiah has been resurrected before the end of time uh, really shapes his eschatology. So those two things become fundamental planks around which Paul's theology is constructed. Right. And so... So let let me know if you want me to take a whack at this because I mean I know that you're super familiar with this concept and you can go at it but I know I'm throwing a couple I told you a bunch of questions I was going to ask you and I haven't asked yeah. any of them yet. That's fine. That doesn't matter. Cool. No, but uh, would you mind explaining a little bit? And I could absolutely take a whack at this. So there's a biblical theologian named Gerhardus Voss, yeah. and he's kind of term well at least within the Reformed theology he's kind of known as the 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 author of this concept of the Paul's two age eschatology and yeah. that's probably not he's probably not the obviously Paul's the, uh, yeah. the author of that concept but, but Voss, his book is classic yes yeah, it's, it's Paul's book, eschatology, yeah, it's and Pauline eschatology is a classic mm-hmm. and Voss sort of popularized it within the yeah. reformed thinking mm-hmm. could you explain that notion of what is two age eschatology what mm-hmm. what is what what is that yeah it's it's uh, basically the conviction that the old age that we are currently in awaiting the return of Christ, awaiting the judgment day, awaiting the renewal and uh, recreation of all things, is over actually overlapping with the New Age. So the New Age has already burst into our world with the resurrection of Christ. And, and this is a weird concept, although there are hints of it in some parts of Judaism, it's a very minor, minority view. Mm-hmm. Everyone expected that resurrection and judgment and all of that will happen at the end of time. Right. And... This is the point that with the New Testament, that expectation is altered because Christ has been raised, allowing um, this new day to break into the old. Mm-hmm. And there's certain things that are just essential to the New Testament that follow from that, like the gift of the Spirit. Okay, the gift of the Spirit belongs, he actually belongs to the future because he's the deposit guaranteeing the inheritance inheritance to come so it's actually the mark of the future on the believer right? yes it's such a weird concept yeah it's super weird right but also we can say we've already been raised with christ even though we haven't yet physically died right. we've spiritually died yeah. and spiritually been raised with christ mm-hmm. and that's a new age thing that happens in the new age to come but it's already happened right and so what we await is the final consummation of that where really what that means is the end of the old age has yes. to come and when christ comes that old age will be completed concluded once and for all and the new age will stand on its own and that's when we'll have the resurrection of the body which will match up with our spiritual resurrection that's already occurred in christ right and that it that two ageness and that's that's the Greek word, you know, I'm not telling you this, but you know, the Greek word for age and is aeon. So that with this, there is this, this, these two aeons and this aeonic structure, as I think Boltman might talk about that or something. A lot of people talk about that, that the aeonic structure, which is one age, one aeon, a second age, accumulates this cluster of metaphors. You, where you, you, I think you even used this word. I don't know if you did it intentionally or not, but you talked about the the day, the eschatological day, which of course comes from Jeremiah and Old Testament prophets, the day of the Lord and Isaiah, of course. Whereas this, the next day or the next age or this coming, whatever that is. Yeah. The, the the future is now and it's these these two so when people say now and not yet well what is now and what is not yet yeah. now is what paul says in galatians 1 4 is the present evil age mm-hmm. the age to come is the day of the lord mm-hmm. and it has the day of the lord occurred yes and no yeah right that's in right christ yeah 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 so i think that's right i mean what we see the new testament writers doing is taking that uh, Old Testament expectation of the day of the Lord and actually extending it between the resurrection and ascension of Christ and the return of Christ. Mm. Um, so the day of the Lord has come in one sense and it has not yet come. Right. And so we await that day and Paul talks about that. You know, we're like, we're at dawn, you know, the, the night is passing and the rays of light are in the air and, and believers are to live as, we, as though we belong to the day, which we do. Uh, which means that's another it, that's an ethical aspect of this two age structure that we don't live according to the old age we live according to the new because that's the age 
to which we truly belong now. Right. And that's another metaphor that accumulates. Well, it's sort of debated in Romans when Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit. Flesh is a, a way of Paul. It's like a, what's the word? It's a, it's a synecdochal way of talking about this age. It's, the flesh is a piece of this age that's that right. he uses as a metaphor to talk about this age that is ruled by the prince of the power of the air and and the spirit is a metaphor but it's also a literal reality but it's it's a metaphor that he uses to talk about all that is to come yeah for the, the future new, that's yes. right the all deposit those- guaranteeing right the fullness yeah and uh paul acknowledges like in galatians uh that while the two ages exist coexist together then we are actually suspended between the two even though we belong to the new our bodies our flesh still belong to the old Mm -hmm. and so there is a a a raging battle between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit and so paul says walk according to the spirit because that is the direction in which you are really going right yes and that's a beautiful setup i think to maybe introduce one more concept i feel like we're walking i feel like we're giving people a crash course and like here are some things you might need to understand the concept of glory which is what we actually want to talk about. Yeah, sure. But I think one more concept I just want to really rehash real quickly is, and we've, we've, it just has a lot of currency in this conversation is this Gaffinian uh, coming from Richard Gaffin's book, which I highly recommend people read uh, resurrection and redemption, which was, I think his dissertation. Um, it's amazing. It's one of the most potent short, but it's like 120 pages or something. It's a great book amazing book and and what it, for me really the the autobiographical significance it has for me is it, it introduced me to the notion that every benefit that we have we have in christ mm-hmm. and every it um all of the literal realities that god grants to us mm-hmm. are it um an exposition of what has occurred to Christ. So soteriology is explaining to us what happened to Christ and therefore to us. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about, I don't know how much he unpacks this, but he started a conversation that has unpacked and really popularized this distinction between two kinds of benefits we get from being united to Christ, Mm -hmm. forensic benefits Mm -hmm. and renovative benefits. Mm -hmm. Or really what this is, is uh, declarative benefits, which is more about um, changing our status Mm -hmm. and effective benefits, which is really about changing our nature. And if you say that, um, this this raises a difficult soteriological question, Mm -hmm. because if you say that you change the forensic benefits like for example that would be justification which is changing our legal status and adoption which is changing our filial status our our our, uh well our filial status right and then so you have justification and adoption these are two renovated benefits then you have sanctification and glorification at least this is kind of how i break it down i don't even know if gaffin would fully agree with the way i'm expositing this concept right now but what where you go from there is if you if you start with the forensic and this is this paradox of benefits in union with christ if we start with the forensic without the renovative being true you have something like a farce or a sociological failure yes an oxymoron almost a the legal fiction language is yeah. really muddy almost too loaded at this point but you've got you've got something wrong because there's an ought that occurs from the status that doesn't make sense unless you have these renovated benefits as well and and uh, the justification fixes our condemnation adoption fixes our exile sanctification fixes our corruption glorification fixes our dot 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 i guess that's something we can talk about but 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 if you begin with the renovative Mm -hmm. and say the renovative is the basis for the forensic well then you have a roman catholic sociology right. where at, we're at literally saved by our works in a yeah. fundamental sense in this age mm-hmm. we can't have that either because paul clearly teaches against that mm-hmm. and what we have is christ in suffering our corruption and our exile and our judgments and our whatever the opposite of glory is mm-hmm. shame mm-hmm. suffering all of that and being as paul says in second timothy vindicated according to the spirit's justification you know adopted not in an adoptionist sense but he's declared to be the son of god according to the spirit mm-hmm. romans 1 4 mm-hmm. 1 yeah, well, yeah 1 4 yada 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 all down the line of all of those things that christ experiences that's why we experience those things mm-hmm. 
Now, that is the, I just wanted to sort of, <laughs> I just wanted to knock that out. <laughs> now we can get to glory. Okay. So glory is a renovative benefit that fixes some opposite concepts. And it's sort of one of those more, um, it's just an elusive concept why i don't know it just hasn't received a ton of lip service but we were talking earlier and you were talking about how you've really been discovering lately the importance of this theme in paul of the hope of glory yeah and i had never heard about that as a central theme before ever mm. ever mm. and i was wondering if you could talk a little about how what what has that discovery been like? What was some what were some big like aha moments for you mm-hmm. in that discovery exegetically? Well, the the discovery kind of came, and I'm not claiming it's a you know sure. I'm the first yeah, to discover yeah, it, right, but yeah. the discovery for me came from uh, the methodology, which is to really look carefully at all the texts. Mm. And to think about eschatological concepts and categories. And obviously, glory is an eschatological category. So, I started chasing it down. And and just with the book on Union with Christ, write about every single instance that occurs in the text. So, I'm writing about glory and I'm thinking, man, this is a long chapter. It keeps going and going and going. It keeps talking about glory. I didn't realize how much. I'd always thought, you know, the Apostle John is the Apostle of glory, which he is. And of course, you know, you know that Paul talks about glory a lot. But I was just struck by how much and... The place it occupies in Paul's overall thought, where time and time again, he speaks of glory as being the ultimate end mm. of everything. Mm. And I guess that's Westminster Confession, you know. Yes, that's right. But, yeah. but it's kind of like discovering that actually in the text for myself and going, wow, that's actually how Paul is thinking. It's the end of everything for God. It's the end of everything for Christ. And it's the end of everything for Paul and believers because Christ shares his glory with us. So, you know, it, it, I just became so intrigued by this question. And one of the major questions is, what exactly is glory? But uh, you mentioned the, the phrase, the hope of glory, yeah. um, which is actually borrowed from Colossians 1. But... I was originally going to call the book, and I'm contracted to call the book Paul and the Age to Come, which is a phrase from Ephesians 1. Right, right. But, uh, you know, about a year ago, I realized I, I need to change this name to Paul and the Hope of Glory. Copyright. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> because this really does sum up um, the whole of Paul's eschatology, mm. that we live now in this current experience by hope mm. for the future experience of glory. Mm. And that's it. That's right. That's it right there. But I, I know that you said you got that that concept from Colossians one. Originally, you were drawing more on this concept from Ephesians one yeah. and the age to come. Yeah. And then there was sort of a I don't know paradigm shift. Might be saying too much, but there was one concept. This concept of the hope of glory seemed more fundamental than yeah. what we were talking about before. The aeonic structure. Yeah. It's not so. So for you, well, if I could just pause you there. Yes, please. So the ionic structure is there for right. Paul, and it's very important for Paul. But it doesn't motivate his um, his person in the way that hope does. Right. So hope is affective. You know, hope is how to live. Mm. Whereas a concept that you know we have this age and then we have that age. That's just recognizing a reality. Right. It's not necessarily affective or life-giving you know but the hope for glory is actually personal affective Mm -hmm. you know he's invested in the glory and it's going to shape the way he lives so in that sense the hope for glory is more summative for paul right than the age to come it's a bigger concept yeah it encompasses the theological and the psychological and the ethical Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. yes it, right, because of that age, this the the future age being the age of judgment, and the present age being an evil age yeah. in domain, and and um, that's interesting. And so for you, so it's interesting to kind of compare these concepts of eschatology mm-hmm. on the one hand, where you've got the two age structure. Mm-hmm. And then bigger than that, that kind of is a, that's a conceptual way of explaining the 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 historical possibility of a hope of glory. Yeah. So you've got that, and then and that's just sort of so. So really, you've got the aeonic structure, which is part of the hope of glory. Mm-hmm. And then then you've got union with Christ, mm-hmm. which doesn't necessarily break down into component parts. So mm-hmm. in the same way, in a parallel way, would you? Is that fair to say? Well, yeah, but it is eschatological. I mean, Albert Schweitzer, who you probably remember yeah, when we worked yeah, through his absolutely. book. Um, 
You know, he argued that the the key function of union with Christ, which he called mysticism, Christ mysticism, right. was to connect us to the future. Right. Because in this period of waiting for the return of Christ, we need to be somehow connected to him. Right. So, it's actually an eschatological thing. Right. And I think that was a really good insight. It's, I would differ and say it's not what it's all about, but it is shaped by this eschatological tension. Right. So, union with Christ it is a way of receiving Christ now in his absence. Because we received, because, and that's sort of the missing piece here, is that we, we the way that we receive Christ, and we were talking about a little bit this earlier, but it's through the Spirit. Yeah. And the Spirit is the eschatological, this is going to sound super kooky, and this is just the way I processed it, but Meredith Klein has been super helpful, uh-huh. and some people find him way out there. Uh-huh. I just, I, f- I feel like Meredith Klein is like taking psychedelics for theologians. You know, it's just, he kind of says that. Oh, there read was, more of his stuff then. <laughs> yeah, Kingdom Prologue and Images of the Spirit and By Oath Consigned. These are just all books where he just, he's, he's really a master of metaphor. And sometimes his metaphors are a stretch. And that's kind of people's problem with him. Sure. And he goes a little out on these tangents where if you buy into the whole ball of wax, then it's super interesting. Okay. But but one of the things he talks about is just the spirit. Mm-hmm. And he he's drawing actually on an article by Willem van Gemmeren in the WTJ where he talks about, well, van Gemmeren talks about the eschatological concept of the spirit in Joel, mm-hmm. I think. But he's drawing on the on Voss's original article the and the, it, you have to, listeners you have to read this article Gerhardus Voss mm-hmm. the Pauline conception of the oh, wait, wait wait the eschatological aspects of the Pauline conception of spirit mm-hmm. or something like that right where where this whole concept that's there is the idea that the spirit is like a time portal yeah and I totally agree totally and yeah. where you have in the Old Testament in the temple the eschatological reality of the future of Christ's return and having been vindicated and and, and put all things right, mm-hmm. mediated through different modalities throughout dispensations of history, right. through the Spirit, because it's mediating the same time. Yeah. It's like literally like time travel, like yeah. theological time travel. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And that, that connects to what I said before. He's the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, which mm-hmm. Paul says a couple of times. Right. And <clears throat> this is the... The, fu- the endowment of the future put on us now, in us now. And so, it's just as, you know, just as the benefits of Christ are applied backwards to the old covenant believers, so the fullness of the new age is connected to us by the Spirit. But I would add to that that he's not only a time portal, but a space portal. So, the Spirit is a cross-dimensional being because the Spirit actually comes from the heavens. Right. But lives in us, and we're not in the heavens; we're on the earth. Right. And so this is a this is um, connecting us to the heavens, which is why Paul can say in Ephesians two six that we've been raised with Christ and seated with Christ in the heavens. Oh gosh, so the fact that we have the Spirit means that we are seated in the her- heavens. It's not up there, like you're kind of thinking, "How can I be here and up there?" Right. The heavens isn't up there. What? The heavens is uh, another dimension. Right. Right. Yes. And the Bible always talks about it being up there as a kind of anthropological way of yes. understanding it. But but really, the heavens is just another dimension for our current space, you know. So, the Spirit, and that's, that's where the spiritual beings, including the Father and the Son and the Spirit, naturally reside, being spirits, right? right. But the Spirit cross, crosses over into our, our dimension and lives in us while we're on the earth, making us kind of cross-dimensional beings at the same time seated in the heavens while also having our feet on the ground on earth wow yes that's you're blowing my mind i haven't because there's a yes that really a theological topology there a topographic uh uh benefits of being with christ and it is in these domains these domains it's interesting too to think about space and time as dimensions the a lot not just physical dimensions but but metaphysical dimensions which is like a whole other yeah. thing yeah. and it's interesting too to think about place is a literal concept and so is time mm-hmm. but it's well, also sort of yeah, yeah. right it's so but but it, they're really slippery when you start to just use the you 
time's very abstract. <laughs> yes, right. It's very phenomenological. And so is space in yeah. place. Yeah, and, uh, yeah they're more so basic. Maybe. Yeah, they're you're right. They're more basic. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And that's what Heidegger discovered, really, was he wrote Being in Time and was unable to solve the metaphysical problem. And only later, mm-hmm. he really realized that place mm-hmm. is topology, is the irreducible metaphor of being. Yeah, it is. Because, I mean, even if you think about the way we think about time, it's it's irreducibly connected to space because we measure a year based on the Earth's rotation around the sun. That's physical space. Mm -hmm. And we measure a day based on the Earth's rotation around its own axis. Mm -hmm. So then time, our divisions of time are just breaking that up further down. But it's already spatially defined from the beginning. So um, space is prior. And this is a fundamental concept of like cognitive linguistics that Mm -hmm. when you are a two-year-old, everything is about space. It's about feeling the world Mm. and only later as your mind develops you can understand abstract concepts like time time is abstracted Mm. it's an abstracted concept from space and uh um, because of that, space is more fundamental. And I think the dimensionality that we're talking about is fundamentally about space. But um what's nice about you know current the current situation in physics Mm. is that they're very happy talking about multi-dimensionality right now and i think that's what we mean by the heavens that's heaven Mm. it's a different dimension right um and it's just so interesting to see physics kind of like catching up to that yes absolutely and it's interesting too to think about the what does the word dimension mean it's just another it all it means is it's another way of measuring something it's another way of even measuring is sort of a crass way of putting it it's a it's it's just something else it's another way it's another yeah. kind it's another genre of what this is mm-hmm. and um uh yeah i love that and i think that that's so there in, in paul and it's you get this version of fantasy sci-fi mm-hmm. type concepts at the core of his mm-hmm. theological concepts here and we think of them very much as just kind of just a cluster of atomic theological concepts that fit together but it's more than them fitting together it is they're they're all functions of the same basic topological reality yeah. which is christ's ascension right. which is of course theologically loaded absolutely yeah, yeah. and and then so this brings us now to glory yeah <laughs> right so so we talked about this we were talking about this at the diner the other day and this is yeah. one of the reasons well not just not just the diner the wildberry yeah. which is i mean just a glory to talk about glory right uh-huh. <laughs> wasn't it there was Morgan it what? brothers was it Morgan? What? Yeah. Oh. i don't know what i'm talking about that. wildberry I just, sounds good there i just under i just kind of cut my entire point <laughs> oh, what are you gonna do <laughs> wait what was it called again Walker Brothers. Oh, Walker Brothers. Walker Brothers, Oh, my man. gosh. Bros. Everybody from Chicago is going to hate me now. Yeah. Everybody from the Burbs is like, how could you confuse Wildberry with Walker, Walker Brothers? <laughs> so, it's, I, I get it mixed up. Yeah. Because I get the omelet both times. Every time uh, I go there, and they're okay. so similar. Okay. I should get the pancakes. But, yeah. um... Pigs oh, in a blanket, that's my That's default. right, which yeah. is what? It's it's protein and pancakes. But it's literally breakfast. It's sausage. It, pigs in a blanket, it but sausages it's... Sausages in, in pancakes. Sausages, wraps, yeah. and pancakes. Yeah. I've never heard of that before. That's breakfast, great. pigs in a blanket. Beautiful. It's amazing. I, uh, and we were talking about glory, and you were, you know, you were sort of unpacking this concept for me, and I just thought it was brilliant. Um, I, I'd never thought about it before, because I, I had only thought about eschatology in that two-age sense, and I had thought that I had really thought meta about it but i really hadn't thought meta enough and i and one of the things that we were kind of going back and forth or we we were just kind of talking out loud about this concept of glory what is it Mm -hmm. you know justification you know justification is legal status you're declared to be in the right and there's some you know nt right new perspective some debate about that but even that aside the concept of being declared to be in the right we can at least grasp that concept Mm -hmm. same with adoption same with sanctification even a little bit you know it's being uncorrupted. It's being made holy. It's being definitively sanctified and progressively sanctified morally. Um, and we can even understand that in like a, a Thomistic Aristotelian sense in which we are being made more whole and brought less disintegrated. We're being more of ourselves living according to our telos. That all makes sense. Glory has these connotations. What it denotes, I don't. Uh, what it denotes, I think we could probably hammer down. But what it connotes are things like publicity, mm-hmm. and things like like the opposite of shame, mm-hmm. uh, fame. You know, something something like public fame. Mm-hmm. And and I guess I would love for you to talk a little bit about how how is glory different than 
positive public fame. Yeah. How is it different than that? Well, first, I think there are different uh, modes of glory. I don't know if that's the right term. Sure. But there's a sense in which, and the, the Bible absolutely affirms this, that God's being is glorious. Right. Even if no one else knows that. Right. So, even if all of humanity doesn't acknowledge his glory, there's a glory that goes unrecognized but is and so in that sense i think this is the most fundamental sense or mode of glory it's actually the radiance of god's character the radiance of god's character it's like god's character just reverberates and um is glory right uh but then you have this sense of the bible of glory being revealed Mm. and so there's a sense in which and really i think what that is is everyone waking up to glory waking Mm. up and seeing it or it being revealed in the final age you know when christ returns in all his glory he's glorious now but we can't see it Mm. right so it doesn't mean the glory doesn't exist and this is how it differs from fame because fame um that's an oxymoron if you say i'm famous no one knows it yet Right, right. Yeah, that, that, that's an oxymoron. Right. But what you could say is like, <clears throat> say Chris Potter is the, the greatest tennis saxophone player in the world today. Now, that might be true whether everyone knows that or not. And you've probably never heard of him before, have you? Right. So, right, right it doesn't change the fact, though, that he's glorious. His playing is right. glorious. The technical feats of which Coltrane didn't even achieve, you know, like. Right. So, so, if no one had ever heard of Chris Potter, there would be a glory about his playing anyway. But then there's this, there's this revelation of glory where everyone sees it and hears it and acknowledges it. Yes, Chris Potter is the greatest jazz saxophone player in the world today. Right. Um, and so I think we get that those two modes in the Bible, this essential glory of God that exists whether anyone knows it or not, mm. although the heavens know it, right. and then this revealed glory that will come with time and that is what that's the glory that Paul longs for and hopes for because you know Colossians 3 4 he says and when Christ is revealed we, we will be revealed with him in glory right and there's this sharing of the glory of Christ where everyone will see he will come with a trumpet he will come with a you know the, the great sound and the archangel like everyone will know and every knee will bow at the glory of Christ mm. but the astonishing thing is Paul saying Christ is going to share that glory is not greedy for that glory mm. and his people are going to share in it and, and that is our glorification right we're actually sharing and this is a further outworking of our union with christ we will share in the glory of christ mm-hmm. and it's it's amazing so paul actually desires glory but not his own glory it's the glory of christ but in desiring the glory of christ he actually receives his own glory it's an it's an irony which is also different from fame because in our world people seek fame um and it's fleeting it doesn't last and it's not real it's human glory what is it it's nothing you know so uh by not seeking glory by actually refuting human glory believers will actually be connected to an unfleeting eternal glory that's not our own it's christ's but it's shared with us and can never be taken away so you know there are all sorts of ways in which i think it differs from fame Mm -hmm. uh well that's that's super helpful because i think you sort of went down the chain of being and sort of unfolding a taxonomy of glory so you've got god's glory which is the hebrew kavod the his the waiting his weightiness that reverberates i thought was a really good way of putting it and even then, what is it? What is the what is the quiddity of that? We could pro- talk for hours about that. But then there's the re- reverberation of that, which is his which is his publicity. It is the his being publicly divine to us. And then there is his being glorious in the resurrection. And then there is our being glorious with him, or him being glorious toward us and with us. And that is the sort of fourfold taxonomy you can go down. And I think the question beneath all of that is, so God is glorious, and I'm willing to put that on hold in a sense in terms of what is that, and even what does it mean for that to be mm-hmm. revealed. Yeah. But because I think, because I think, well, let me just say that. I'm, I'm okay putting it on hold, really digging down into the nuance of how would we really define that. But, but then I think something that might elucidate that is to say, well, if justification, if Christ's vindication according to the Spirit, his justification mm-hmm. is the God's 
public legal reversal of the condemnation mm -hmm. which he declared over Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. Of what negative experience or of what negative reality is glorification the reversal? Yeah. Uh, it is, it's shame. I, I like to correlate it to um, Paul's theology of the cross mm. and the resurrection. Mm. So, the only glory, and this is where I will differ with some interpreters, the only glory that exists for us now, as opposed to a hope for the for future glorification, mm -hmm. is the glory of the cross, suffering, which is actually suffering and shame. Yeah. So when Paul glories, he glories in the cross because he knows it's indicative of the opposite that's going to come. That's right. Oh, and so all reality and all the Christian life is shaped by those two events: the cross mm -hmm. and the resurrection. We now we live while we're in this age. We live in the cross. Mm -hmm. This is the age of the cross. Right. And we await resurrection. Right. And so Jesus. Death and resurrection becomes a model for us, and I'm absolutely convinced for Paul. That's exactly what he means. So that in 2 Corinthians, this is the classic place for it, where he's comparing himself to the super apostles, you know, and they they boast in their rhetorical skills. They boast in their whatever, whatever, you know, their good looks or whatever it is. Paul boasts in his sufferings. Mm. Why would you boast in sufferings to a culture that thinks that sufferings are shameful? You know, right. that, that reveal your weakness. Right. He says, I'm weak. I'm just a jar of clay, mm. but i got treasure inside. Mm. And the message is the treasure because the message connects you to this future glory. So, outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are re being renewed day by day. So, there's an inner glory, which is actually, I think, the hope th that's connected to the future glory. Right. But the outer glory is suffering and brokenness and receiving the world's shame and 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 so for paul that's living out the cross in in hope of the resurrection so um just allow me to allow me to be a little bit annoying i guess go, go ahead. Yeah. so so the spirit the our being united with christ in the spirit by the spirit now first corinthians 15 45 to 55 you know is are we have assurance of salvation we have assurance in in, in, in multiple dimensions but yeah. but but we are justified yeah. and we will be justified yeah. we are adopted and yet we await our adoption mm -hmm. we are have been definitively sanctified and are being progressively sanctified and will one day be perfected mm -hmm. what is the glory mm -hmm. is it in because i'm getting the sense that from what you're saying is that it's an experience. It's it's almost like an experience, yeah. uh, more, sort of a phenomenal. Lot. It's, I mean, if if sanctification takes place through through mortification, mm -hmm. well, it's one way you could take place. But but glorification, pres our present glorification, is is it in our in in our negative experiences? N not not in a not in a uh, not not sadistic. That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, where we love we fall in, where we love pain as people are like it's this word I, I can't think of the word masochistic all right where it's it's not that it's we're not that. Yeah. it's not masochism yeah um but it's a sense of um if suff suffering is an experience mm -hmm. It's not justification. Yeah. It's not adoption. Yeah. Those are tr realities that we actually haven't experienced. They're true of us, but we haven't yeah. phenomenologically yeah. Uh, approached that day. Yeah. We've experienced them through faith, by faith, not by sight. Mm -hmm. Glory, if if it's the opposite of suffering, suffering is an it's experience. It's also an experience. It's a phenomenology. It hasn't happened yet. Right. And that's where I differ with some. Mm. And maybe that's where we differ on our interpretation of Romans 8.30. Right. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm open. I'm, I really, yeah. Um, because, I mean, I think that verse is mistranslated. So, I would love, let's get into it. Yeah. So, uh, Romans 8.30 says, yeah. uh, Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, these are a string of Greek aorists, which are traditionally understood as the past tenses, you know. And so, they're all translated as past tense referring. But the problem one, and that all works fine for pre being predestined and being called and being justified, but it doesn't work so well with glorified, and then it jars a little. And so, what you get the commentators doing is what I call exegetical fancy footwork. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so, they're really trying to explain why the aorist is being used here, which is supposed to be a past referring tense, 
of glorification, which everything in the New Testament seems to say is a future reality, not a present one. Mm. So, uh, they make arguments like, and I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> arguments like <laughs> our, glorific- our future glorification is so certain that Paul uses a past referring tense yeah. to say, it's done. Yeah. It's like we might say, consider it done. I did a favor for someone the other day. Before I did it, I said, consider it done. Mm. You know, and But it was not done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, they sort of appeal to that as this is why the aorist is being used here. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, these commentators are not up to speed with advances in verbal aspect theory. Uh-oh. And the aorists does not always refer to the past. A clear example is in, Math- in Mark 111, where Jesus is being baptized by John in the Jordan River and a voice comes down from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom, Eudokisa, I was pleased. <laughs> Aorist, Aorist, I was pleased. <laughs> no one translates it as a past tense. Yeah. No one. <laughs> they always translate it as a present. Yeah. I am pleased, right. but it's an aorist. It's a classic example. There are many, about 15% of aorist indicatives don't refer to the past mm. in the New Testament. So, actually, what I think all these aorists are are what I would call gnomic aorists. Mm. That is, they're referring to a timeless reality. Mm. And so, it would read something like this. And those he predestines, he calls... And those he calls, he justifies. And those he justifies, he glorifies. This is not setting those actions in time. It's saying, this is what God does. Mm. Okay. And maybe there's a chain there, like an auto salutis. Maybe we'll talk about that too. But, sure. um, but that's the point. God does this and he does this and he does this. Not he did this, he did this, he did this. And he kind of did this, but hasn't really done this yet. <laughs> right. But let's talk about that for a while. You know. <laughs> yeah. And so just by understanding how the Greek verbal system works, I think you just remove that whole problem. Right. And you can then appreciate that the rest of the New Testament teaches glorification as future. Yes. It's a future experience. Right. So you're saying basically two reasons why translating this chain here as a past aorist are wrong is because a you you translate it past 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 or, or, or sorry past future past future uh uh past kind of future mm-hmm. or like like basically you know you, you have to you have to render the pastness of glorification differently yeah. than the other two aorist verbs yeah. even though yeah. uh it's the same syntactically it's the same syntactical right. classification right. so that's one problem and then the second problem I know I had it just in the tip of my brain, and I, 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 I uh, oh, the second problem is simply with the aspect of the verb is re- is is the assumption that Eris is going to be passed, yeah. which is a, it was a false assumption. It's not accurate. It doesn't accurately reflect the way Greek is used in the New Testament. So, so, so you have to be inconsistent in your rendering of the Eris, and you also make a false assumption about how the Eris will operate. This there. is a great example of why dedicating myself to studying Greek is actually for exegesis yes. because this really important verse it really hinges on your understanding of the Greek verbal system yeah yeah. Dude, have you, do, you, do you watch the Joe Rogan podcast at all sorry what do you watch the Joe Rogan podcast I have podcast not you've told me many oh, times yeah. no no, no. I, I, well, haven't. I haven't Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson was on there a while ago uh-huh. he's a, you know the astrophysicist who hosts Cosmos or whatever and he has a new book coming out about the relationship between military history and astrophysics oh. and how all these great military advances throughout history actually hinged upon uh, discoveries, in it's discoveries in astrophysics right. that they didn't even couldn't have predicted would help them. Wow! Like yeah. it, like Columbus yeah. and and the Europeans knowing the stars were able to use them to manipulate the Native Americans and predict uh-huh. eclipses and things like that. Uh-huh. Also, uh, uh, going uh, uh, doing nuclear work, you know, at the Manhattan Project. Uh-huh. Like they were all there were a bunch of astrophysicists and the, uh, uh, astrophysicists at that Manhattan Project because they were sharing notes because they were all studying the same stuff and they were like, oh, you guys have been doing this. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, the, we can make a bomb from this. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. Hubble telescope was actually they had like thirty years of prototypes of that before wow. NASA even knew that they wanted to or, or what was it I forget what it was but but anyway all this stuff were basically great military victories have occurred because of advanced astrophysics knowledge yeah. and I feel like there's a parallel there between Greek knowledge and yeah. theology yeah. where the better you know Greek and the better you know the language mm-hmm the more confidence you have when you approach the text of Scripture. Well, all you need to think about is all our theology derives from texts. Right. And our texts are written 
in certain languages. <laughs> it's, yes. So, and, and this is a great example of if, if, if somebody talks to you about this and, and, and they're telling you, oh, no, trust me, it's Aorist. Don't worry yeah. about it. Who are you, you know, yeah. unless, unless you're sort of up to date knowing this stuff, how are you going to engage in dialogue yeah, about that? Yeah, you can't because you, you can't. don't even know there's a discussion about that. Which is why yeah. it's important to take Greek exegesis one and two seriously while you're in seminary. Yeah. yeah. And so when people say, oh, it's an ancillary thing, like many seminaries are doing now, yeah. it's like a extra thing that, you know, if you're really dedicated, whatever. No, it's a basic thing. Yeah. It's a fundamental thing. Yeah. Uh, and you just ask serious ancient historians yeah you know no one does ancient history without reading the original text as originally written yes in the original languages right it's basic yes you know so it's actually the foundation because our theology is all text based yes indeed yeah and um yeah i absolutely agree and, and just one little anecdote nasser invented velcro Oh, did they really? Yeah, yeah. Why, so oh, you oh, could add I mean, that to your story. Though. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, well, yeah. that makes sense because it needs in in zero gravity situations. Yeah. Is, I'm assuming that was something the, like that. Something like that. They didn't want to use zips. Really? Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Good for NASA. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so so this brings us to I think so if we render it, can you tell us again how you're translating this verse? Yeah. From- so I'm actually going to argue this in the book that I'm w- writing right now. I've already written on this passage, oh, and and so. Yeah. I would translate it as, I mean, I would analyze it as a series of nomic aorists, which by definition are verbs that are referring to realities that are outside time. They're not right. anchored in a specific time. They're speaking about general realities, right. okay, timeless realities. Mm-hmm. And I would translate it as those he predestines, he also calls, and those he calls, he also justifies, and those he justifies, he glorifies. Mm-hmm. So he's to- it's talking about a general reality of what God does, not when God did it. Right. That's not the point. It's what God does. Right. He predestines you. He calls you. He justifies you. He glorifies you. Right. Okay. And so uh, it's a very it's a pretty common use of the aorist actually, and it kind of resolves all your exegetical problems right away. Right. And that's it's interesting. Yeah. And that that's a concept that people should know. This nomic is G N O M I C. It means it just means for something to be nomic, it just means this is how it works. If it's, you're using a word in a nomic way, it means you're using it to express this is a norm. This is how mm-hmm. things usually yeah. happen. It's a norm. It's not connected to a specific action in time. It's right. like a it's like a Floating reality. Yeah, and people often misuse or misconstrue tenses in the Greek to overcommunicate the temporal That's right. connotation of the word That's right. or denotation of the word. Exactly. Tense in Greek does not always denote or connote a particular time of action. And this relates to what we were talking about before, the relationship between space and time, yeah. because it's a linguistic fact that all languages develop from primarily spatial ways of perceiving the world and as they develop they become more highly abstract and become much more temporal which is actually a sign of their uh complexity and modernized you know stage of the language but that means that all ancient languages really are coming out of a place where everything is about space Mm. and time is sort of being overladen later um and this was uh demonstrated in part by um Tony Swain at the University of Sydney wrote a book about some Aboriginal languages that when Europeans first came to Australia, these Aboriginal languages had no words for time. They had no concepts for time. And that was part of the proof that it was a very primitive culture Mm. because they were still in that very spatial way of thinking about everything. Oops. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so all of that is to say, you know, this space time thing with space being prior and time being an extension an abstraction out from space mm. uh, is actually seen in languages. And modern Greek today is a very temporal language, but ancient Greek is a very spatial language. Mm. And the, you can see the temporal element creeping in and developing from Homer onwards. But by the time of the New Testament, it's still, the verbs are still operating primarily at a spatial level. Right. And, and right. And the, the more the temporalized a, a language is the more abstract its concepts are yeah. is what you're saying yeah and more yeah. more abstract the culture is 
mm-hmm. you know, the culture is... I mean, we can't really think about reality apart from time. Right. But but time is made up. It's made I mean, up, yeah. It doesn't really exist. It, right. Space exists. Yeah, and it, yeah. there's a philosopher named Jeffrey Malpas, actually, who argues that that's why Heidegger got so stuck in his metaphysics, was because he was stuck on this notion of time. Yeah. It was blocking him from solving really, the metaphysical problems. It's not really... It's just in our heads. Yeah, because he was seeing it as fundamentalist metaphysics, yeah. and it's not. It's not. Space is. Yeah. yeah. So true. Yeah. It, it, even when you think about... Me, like, even, even you talking about union with Christ, going back to that, all of the metaphors for union with Christ or even even just the very nature of prepositions they're spatial they're spatial all yeah. of them yeah is that true well well actually <laughs> well actually what's I was overplaying my hand there <laughs> no 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 you're right they're all originally spatial right and then as they develop in their usage they become right more abstracted mm. so is for example ace right. you know epsilon yota sigma means into that's the gloss you learn right. right like going into a room but in the new testament especially in epistles mm. it hardly ever means that mm. it means purpose for mm. and that is an abstraction of the idea of moving into something mm. you know this is my direction this is why i'm doing it for but you know cognitive linguistics shows that that's a very common progression for the development of the use of prepositions from spatial to temporal wow so that's fascinating and i think that instructive for what we're talking about here particularly with glorification and eschatology because again people think of eschatology fundamentally as a temporal concept Mm -hmm. and it is temporal but it's fundamentally um uh, uh, as you were saying earlier, topological. And that informs here, and that instructs how we are conceiving of glorification. And even this notion, I think that that is actually a good segue for us as we sort of transition to this final concept that we're going to deal with, which is the ordo salutis. Because you've got time, and you've got space. And then in between that, you have this concept of a sequence. Yeah. And a sequence could be a logical sequence. It could be uh, a, a topological dependence, a re- mutual reliance. It could be a chronological mm-hmm. uh, sequence, which would be uh, temporal. What sort of... And, and the ordo salutis it just means Latin for order of salvation. It's this notion of what... You're called, you know, you're God predestines, and then you're called, and then you are uh, uh, united with Christ, and then you believe, and then you're sanctified, and then you're, glo- you know, it's this, the Ordo Salutis is essentially what's the sequence of salvation? What is the order logically or chronologically in which receive, we receive or experience the benefits of salvation? Um, but glorification here, what what is happening here? Um, with glorification in Romans 8 relative to the Ordo Salutis. What is it telling us about well, that? As, as I mentioned earlier, I think for Paul, glory is the end mm-hmm. of everything. Mm-hmm. And, and, by end. and by end, I mean not only the finish, but the goal. Mm-hmm. So this means our glorification is our end product. That's where we are going. I don't think we're there. I don't think we've been glorified yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we are connected to glory by being connected to Christ by the Spirit, but um, it's an unseen glory, and glory actually is an experience. It is actually, you know, well, yeah, the typology of glory, that, that sure. part of that, part of that, where we fit in, it's an experience of being glorified, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, that's where it is analogous to fame, because mm-hmm. fame is when people recognize you, right? right? And that that is yet to happen for us. That's that second <laughs> Which that that's that's yeah. the second and third layer of the taxonomy that's right. of glory. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. So um, that hasn't happened. You know, the world does not see us as glorified. Right. The world fools. sees us First as the fools. Too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm convinced we have not experienced that yet. We have not been glorified yet. Right. Um, and so the auto salutis, some parts of it are temporal, if that's the right word, like predestination. It's got the word pre, it's got the prefix pre. <laughs> right, right, right. It has to come first, yeah. right? It, it, it is pre, right. um, because, you know, Ephesians 1 says you know, we're predestined before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Okay. So we, Paul actually indicates when that happens is before anything's even created. Right. We're predestined. But these other things of like, um, justification and sanctification and whatever else occasion, I think they all occur simultaneously in our union with Christ. So the moment we are united to Christ by faith, 
then we are justified. But not glorification. And we're sanctified, but I don't believe we're glorified. That's interesting. That's really subtle distinction here. I'll say so. I'll, so I'm going to link to this article uh-huh. just so people can understand this article by Dane Ortland in, in Jets. And I think we can distinguish this view from, from that view. I, I think it's a really subtle distinction because there are a lot of formal similarities mm-hmm. with the way that this verse is typically construed, which is uh, those he has, what is the final one? Is those he has justified, he has also glorified. glorified. Yeah. So, those he has justified, he has also glorified. People saying, well, by justified, he means past in Christ. By glorified, he means, well, consider it done, even though it hasn't. It's so sure that it's going to happen. Yeah. We're just going to say, we're just going to use the aorist anyway. I mean, who cares? We're using aorist, might as well. You get an aorist, <laughs> yeah. you get an aorist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it's, it's not that, but it is not yet yeah. and what we have to be is unafraid of recognizing that it's not yet and the yeah. way that we know that it's or the space the space no pun intended that this that this verse makes for it being not yet is the gnomic rendering of these aorists right. those he justifies he glorifies yeah. not those he justified he glorified that's right. good as done good as yeah. done yeah. right having said that yeah absolutely that's a good recap of it but having said that um, we are promised glory, mm. and that's why Paul can endure all suffering, mm. because he knows he's absolutely confident in the glory to come, and that's as certain as death leads to resurrection. You know, right. once you're in Christ, so suffering leads to glory, which is why he calls it. Doesn't he call in Second Corinthians four? Doesn't he call his suffering glory? Yeah, yeah. He glories in his sufferings, which is like a great way of putting it that's right yeah because the sufferings are the indication that he will be glorified right so he can glory in his sufferings because that's like the it's like an easter egg it's like ooh yeah suffering right yeah and and analogous to the down payment of the spirit Mm. right in a non-masochistic way yeah non-masochistic because he if it was masochism it would be it would be savoring the suffering for its own sake yeah and 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 almost like saying that the suffering is achieving a glory whereas actually i think suffering is a sign of Mm. the glory to come Mm. like a deposit right like a deposit yeah it's marking you as yeah you're marked for glory and the evidence is you're suffering for christ Mm. right not yeah and not suffering in general not like no suffering stole a bunch of money yeah and now and now he's in prison like jesus and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no 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 no, no, no. no. yeah suffering for christ bearing witness to christ and being persecuted for that Mm -hmm. being ridiculed for that Mm -hmm. that ridicule that persecution that is an indication that you're on the right path that glory is to come yeah 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 Wow. Well, that's beautiful, man. I love that. Well, hey, thanks for rolling with this, man. This has been great. It's been fun. Yeah, Um, thanks. I want to give you an opportunity to sort of um, just promote anything that you're doing. I know you have like a billion projects that you're coming Uh out with. A couple of things that I really want people to know about is your video series, Mm -hmm. In Pursuit of Paul, Mm -hmm. In Pursuit of Peter, which they can get on iTunes. iTunes, uh, Amazon Video, Mm -hmm. various other places. Uh, And then you're coming out soon with... In Pursuit of John, uh, we're actually still we're working on that right now, and uh, be out sometime next year. And you're basically in these video series, you go on site, you yeah. go to Greece, you go to yeah, Israel, yeah, yeah. and you are highlighting place, yeah. the humanity of these yeah. these authors. Yeah, you're yeah. saying autobiographically, who were they? Yeah, who were they walking in their footsteps? That sort of thing, which sounds a little cliche, but not at all. But when you think about the locations and what was going on in these locations and who the people were in these locations, then you really start to get more of a sense of, yeah, the very human side. Like, for example, I was really struck by the fact that Paul walked across Turkey, the whole of Turkey, <laughs> twice. Did you walk across Turkey? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> you should have, man. I flew across it a few times. Yeah, sure. But, you know, you were on a Roman road yeah. with Marcus saying 150 miles to Pisidian Antioch, Whoa. you know, from Perge. And you was like, Oh, he actually walked yeah. and did this stuff. And we, we used to thinking about Paul as a man of action, which he was. Mm. But it was actually punctuated action where he was actually traveling a lot yeah. and doing nothing except walking, <laughs> maybe composing Romans in his head. Yeah, right. You know? uh, and then arriving an action, mm. you know? And mm. it just really changed the way I think about 
what's going on with him and the fact that right. you know I'd never really taken seriously that there's a 14 year gap between Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus and his first missionary journey you never think about that 14 years never think you, about you, that you, you, you might think oh people complain about theological education being 3 <laughs> or 4 years and you go well the, the disciples didn't do it <laughs> yeah okay uh, Paul yeah. had 14 years right. of sitting on this new revelation of right. Christ and that's and after studying the Old Testament for who knows how many years yeah because yeah. I think he's spending all that time correlating his pre-existing Pharisaic knowledge of the scriptures mm. with the revelation of Christ. Wow. You know. So, it's no surprise when he starts writing for the first of well, the letters that we have, right. I think Galatians is first from his first missionary journey. It's like a full exposition of how the whole Bible fits together in light of Christ. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. He didn't right. just like go, oh yeah, bam. Yeah. <laughs> Next day, I'll yeah. write like Galatians. his first sermon. He's like, yeah. 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 No, it's like 14 years later. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, I highly commend those videos and I highly commend that people check those out. Use them with your churches. Use them just individually for yourself. Uh, seminary student, lady, highly recommended. And then you've got a couple books coming. Well, we got multiple books coming out. Um, uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of you, but I don't even know what's coming out next, honestly, for you. What is coming out next? Well, I'm working on two things. Um, and uh, one is this book on Paul, Paul and Hope of Glory. Right. It, I Copyright. think will be called. Yeah. yeah. Don't copy that title, everybody. <laughs> and I'm um, hoping to finish that in the first half of next year, which probably means it's going to be a 2020 release. Mm. And uh, hopefully this year I'm finishing a book that I'm co-authoring with uh, Jonathan Pennington, a great Gospels scholar at Southern Seminary, uh, an introduction to the New Testament, especially aimed at college students. So undergrad, first thing they read about the New Testament at an academic level. We're writing that, trying to wrap that up this year. Hopefully it'll be a 2019 release. We'll see. I love that. And, yeah. Yeah, that's- and that's called Reading the New Testament as Christian Scripture. Ooh, that's going to be great. And Baker's going to do a really good job with that because they do a lot of the theological interpretation stuff. They obviously have a strong biblical studies um, line. So, and this is thankfully where New Testament studies is going or returning to, yeah. which you're allowed to read theological texts theologically. Yeah, as they were intended to be read for the church, as they were intended yes, to be read. Right. What yeah. do they call it? Believing criticism is yeah. that kind of the camp? Of it? So, yeah, it's growing. Yeah. And I mean, actually, if you think about it, even if you're not believing, it makes perfect sense because they're written by believers to believers. Yes. So, right. Even sociologists make that distinction between. I was reading this the other day as I was doing some philosophical research between the Emmy and the Etsy or something like that. And it's like sociology from the outside and then sociology from the inside. Right. And if you can't get that from the inside perspective, you're not really doing it right. Oh, no, you're yeah, not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's good. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Right. Which is methodologically relevant for studying mm-hmm. the New Testament, mm-hmm. which is why I'm excited about that book as well. And yeah. then social media, you're just Con Campbell on, on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Twitter. Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Cool. Twitter. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming on man this is super fun thanks for having me this, i really this enjoyed is, it this yeah. is a ton of fun i'll yeah. be back next friday oh. no, i'm just kidding, no, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's fine you're welcome thanks bro thanks man